Welcome. The following presentation was recorded at the annual Best Practices for Pollinators Summit hosted by Pollinator Friendly Alliance and the Xerxes Society. Please consider participating in the annual summit next year. You can find more about the summit at pollinatorfriendly.org slash summit. Hi, everybody. Great to be here. Um, and thank you to Pollinator Friendly Alliance for the invitation to present at the summit. Um, so I am going to be presenting on some idea generating themes, um, looking at how do we restore landscapes outside of our own um, yards. So thinking about your neighborhood park that has some natural areas or some larger tracts of land that are primarily natural habitat. I've been really thinking about uh, what, what are the goals uh, given that we are uh, facing a changing climate. So I wanted to talk about some of the um, problems um, that are we're facing going forward, but first really to look back into the past so that we all have a better understanding of thousands of years of uh, types of land stewardship by Native Americans uh, and specifically the role of fire. Because if we don't sort of understand that foundational way in which landscapes were man managed for thousands of years, uh, we can't identify some of the problems that we're facing in order to create more biodiverse landscapes. So, I'm going to talk a little bit about the past and, and the importance of fire uh, in maintaining some of these systems. Then also look into the future and the warming climate and trying to understand how we go forward and what decisions we may need to make in order to continue to create and restore more biodiverse habitat for not only pollinators, but as Scott talked about, um, all organisms. So really thinking about forming that strong foundation with diversity of plants that is going to support a diversity of, in, of insects. So um, that's, I always sort of lock onto that foundation of those two primary things. But if we can accomplish that, then we are starting to build in ecosystem functionality and hopefully climate resiliency. So some of the things I want to talk about are uh, somewhat in Midwestern in theme, but I think these things can also be applied to other areas throughout the country. So I'm in Minnesota, uh, where Pollinator Friendly Alliance is as well, and this is sort of our state, and we are fortunate to have three primary biomes in Minnesota. As you can see on that map outline, the uh, lower southwest portion was formerly prairie. That middle section is a mix of uh, deciduous forest and oak savannas. And then we have our wonderful northern landscapes of uh, boreal and uh, mixed conifer forests. So we, not all states have these three converging biomes, and it's what makes Minnesota somewhat unique. Now with climate change, um, modeling is predicting that where we are in the Twin Cities area, for example, uh, that we in the future by 2070 may have the climate of uh, Manhattan, Kansas. And that is shifting our climate into hotter and drier conditions. And as Scott talked about, uh, we have to think about managing and restoring landscapes that are resilient in hotter and drier conditions, if that indeed is what will happen by 2070. And this, these are some of the things I'm thinking about as I do a large uh, portion of my work is volunteer work doing ecological restoration. So making sure that we're moving or transitioning systems to adapt to climate change. This is a, a portion of the state of Minnesota showing the historical plant communities. And this was a map generated uh, between, or after the surveys were conducted between 1848 and 1907 here in Minnesota, but it's basically showing those three primary biomes. And the map, the map was actually developed by a cartographer uh, named Francis Marshner. He never in fact uh, came to Minnesota to my knowledge, but he 
uh, was based in Washington, D.C., and looked at the survey records. The surveyors would make note at each transect, and they would uh, note inside of their notebooks um, various bearing trees, so large trees that were near the transect. And they also described the conditions on the ground, uh, including um, the environmental conditions, the types of habitat, the predominant trees. And from all of this information, Francis Marshner has created this Marshner map. The map is called the original vegetation, but let's put original in quotation marks. It's just uh, a single point in time uh, through a long history of landscape change that shows what our state was in that time period. But it can be a useful tool to understand um, what has happened over maybe hundreds, but also thousands of years. And as we had uh, warming in the last 10,000 years, that middle tension zone would have pushed up uh, more northerly, uh, pushing those mixed conifer forests up much higher or northerly in Minnesota. When we had cooling periods, that tension zone would shift downward and our uh, state would have become more forested for a period of time. But there are a number of factors, of course, climatic and geographical factors. Again, precipitation, also uh, topography is going to influence all of those uh, boundaries of the individual plant community colors here on this map. But the things I wanna talk about from a historical perspective is the uh, regular use of fire by Native Americans, uh, in addition to uh, the role of grazing animals. And we know, uh, everybody knows this story. This is just a close up of a, a large county in the metro area. The image on the left showing that pre settled, pre European settlement plant communities intact. And then maybe you probably can't even see the little fragments left today in, in the county now. So, this we've had large scale landscape change uh, since European settlement. Uh, fire exclusion is one of the primary drivers of uh, change in the composition of plant communities. And then of course that key other keystone species, the grazing animals such as bison and elk have been extirpated. So this has radically changed uh, the, the former original vegetation makeup. But then of course, as more Europeans arrived, they uh, largely converted a lot of these grassland systems uh, for agriculture uh, and fast forward even farther, we're developing land as Scott talked about at a very rapid rate. So a lot of land, land conversion into uses for humans. Uh, what I really wanna focus on here um, for a lot of the talk is a, a phenomenon called mesofication. And I'll be defining that in a, about two thirds of the talk. But I really want to focus on oak ecosystems and, and their importance and how I think they may be a, a good target or model for various places in the Midwest for climate resiliency. So this is a, a graphic from the Tall Grass Restoration Handbook, and we often hear about um, this idea of succession of a fallow field that's no longer used for agriculture succeeding eventually over time to a forest. And that um, succession model is really based on a post Euro American settlement um, phenomena in the landscape and it doesn't account for uh, how these landscapes were historically maintained by fire. So I like to think of it more as a continuum uh, with prairie, savanna, woodland, and ultimately forest. What I want to note here on this slide is that the prairie, savanna, and woodland systems are all would have been fire maintained systems, whereas a forest would have occurred on places where fire was excluded, uh, steep slopes facing east or north, for example, or perhaps there was a, a number of rivers that were creating natural fire breaks where um, an area was not burned with relative frequency. And uh, many people are really just unaware of the, of the extent of fires that were um, fueled or lit by Native Americans throughout the country. So it's not just a uniquely Midwestern grassland phenomena um, throughout North America. 
most of the landscape was uh, regularly burned. And uh, the first accounts from uh, first European explorers arriving on the eastern shore of North America did um, describe these landscapes as open and park-like. And researchers look at fire scars on um, very old trees and are able to track the frequency of fire in a given area. But uh, the idea that the east, uh, the eastern part of the country uh, was forested at the, the point of first contact by Europeans is false. Um, fire was used so extensively, uh, but for those areas in the east and perhaps southeast that have had a longer cultural and ecological timeline of European settlement, um, a lot of the evidence has been lost in, in order to support that. And so this map uh, model of fire frequency was uh, created in this 2012 study, and this is pre pre 1850s fire frequency. Um, the redder, the hot red um, coloring is a fire frequency of anywhere from two to four years. Uh, the yellow and greenish parts anywhere from 12 to 20 and all the way up until uh, a 200 year fire frequency. The, the hot, the pink and the really purple sections are, you, as you can tell, are on mountainous type landscapes where again, uh, cool east or west, east facing or north facing slopes would have created natural fire breaks. But this map is really illustrating that um, fire was a, a commonly used land stewardship tool um, pre-1850s by Native Americans. And why did they light fires? Well, they had a number of reasons. Um, of course, fire maintained these open and very diverse grassland systems, which in turn uh, provided high quality and nutrient rich uh, grasses that uh, some of the primary mammals that they were hunting, such as bison, uh, really were attracted to and fed on. Uh, fire helped to suppress uh, dense underbrush, and so it kept uh, even woodlands more open, allowing for uh, better hunting and sightline opportunities, uh, in addition to travel, as well as uh, perhaps being able to see uh, warring or neighboring tribes coming in. Um, so there was a number of reasons that fire was used, and I'm just touching on a few. But uh, in addition to the um, mammals that the Native Americans may have been hunting for their own sustenance, fire also uh, helped to clear land for food cultivation. And it also promoted the uh, abundance of flowers as well as uh, result, in a, <laughs> which would result in an abundance of fruit uh, in an area that had been recently burned. And they intuitively learned this and would apply this, this primarily tool in order to provide their communities with high, uh, high quality nutritional food. So an example is uh, blueberries, uh, ericaceous plants respond very well to burning and produce a heavy fruit crop after an area has been burned. So Native Americans would use fire for a, a, a large number of reasons. Um, and again, I was touching on a few. So switching back to the Minnesota map um, and those bearing trees that the surveyors noted in their notebooks, um, that white Perry, Prairie Parkland province area is uh, not colored because it was historically prairie. So uh, it did not have trees, but that middle zone, that tension zone you can see is uh, a very dark red. And this color uh, gradient is really showing um, the percentage of bearing trees that were fire tolerant. And so the darker red um, is really means the more trees were fire tolerant. You can see the couple of circles that they've highlighted on, on this study, um, the really large green area in the uh, north central part of the state, which is a, a a former glacial lake and low-lying wetland complex now. Um, that green section in the bottom middle tension zone is called the Big Woods, and there were large rivers that created uh, fire breaks on the western, northern, northern, and southern boundaries that really kept that um, little area in a more forested state. 
So the Bering trees, even the North Shore throughout uh, our boundary waters uh, was burned with regular frequency. And to break down uh, from this uh, same study, they looked at it from the uh, pyrophilic or fire tolerant trees, uh, comparing those with the predominance of pyrophobic or fire intolerant or mesophytic trees. And these deciduous trees, the white oaks, the oaks, the hickories, uh, make up what we would call oak savannas and oak woodlands. Um, similarly, pines are fire tolerant. So some plant communities could be described as pine barrens that would be maintained by fire. And then looking at these pyrophobic tree species, making up our deciduous and also floodplain forests that were again uh, in moist areas or growing on those steep slopes or with rivers acting as fire breaks where the, this more forested state would have occurred. And then of course, coniferous forests in, in the Northern part of the state, particularly in more uh, low-lying areas. So the fire frequency on the landscape uh, really did influence the ultimate result. Uh, and of course, if you're burning a spot or a site every two years, that's not going to allow for woody plant establishment. So you're keeping that as a prairie or meadow or open grassland system. A 10 to 20 fire um, year interval uh, would mean that woody plants such as some of those fire tolerant tree species like oaks would start to be able to grow, uh, develop thick enough bark in order for them to remain within those systems. Uh, a hundred year plus fire interval again would result in a closed canopy forest. And what uh, I'm thinking about from a climate resiliency standpoint and also a capacity of these different systems to sequester carbon is these grassland systems are, are much better at sequestering more carbon in the soil than a, than a forested system. And this is a historical map looking at the uh, region of tall grass prairie in addition to oak savanna and oak woodlands, all fire maintained systems. We hear a lot about how much prairie we've actually lost um, here in Minnesota. We have less than 1% of original prairie remaining. But we, what we really don't hear about is um, how uh, globally endangered oak savannas are. Uh, historically, it made up about 15 million, 50 million acres of oak savanna occurred in the Midwest. And now we only have 0.06% remaining today. So it's actually one of the world's most endangered ecosystems. And we have these very uh, degraded or sort of uh, frameworks of what was formerly Oak Savannah's even here in our metro area, uh, but we don't have many models that are showing uh, functional and restored um, examples of these almost lost Oak Savannah's. And fire in, did influence, the frequency influenced um, whether or not these Oak trees would become established and transitioning um, from that, that prairie to forest continuum a prairie into perhaps an oak savanna. Uh, though some of, some of the traits that oaks uh, possess in order to withstand these periodic fires uh, is that they um, develop relatively thick bark at a young age, uh, usually about seven to 10 years. They can withstand a low intensity fire such as this on this image, um, burning through the understory. Oaks have the ability to close wounds rapidly. The oaks also have very deep tap roots. So a lot of their um, growth structure is located below ground. So even if the oak is burned back to the surface, um, the ability to quickly regenerate and produce uh, more a new leader. They are also slow growing, um, very drought tolerant. And, and in addition, long lived. So if we are going to transition uh, our systems to more grassland systems, it makes sense uh, to incorporate uh, oaks and, and think about this more as an oak system. 
Now, if we look at mesophytic or fire intolerant trees, such as maples, the, one of the big differences is the capacity of these systems to carry a fire. And oak leaves are thick. Um, they tend to dry quickly and curl, uh, and that creates air spaces. So oak leaf litter alone, even if there wasn't grassland vegetation, um, can, can uh, help transition or move a fire through a landscape. Um, that is not the case with maple leaf litter or other mesophytic trees. It tends to be thinner. It tends to mat down and hold moisture. So uh, it's very hard to carry a fire um, through systems with uh, fire intolerant tree leaf litter. And we know from uh, Douglas Tallamy's work uh, with keystone species, uh, these are plant species that host uh, a very high number or, or host plants for a very high number of caterpillar and moth species, uh, lepidopteran larvae, uh, that oaks are a keystone species or one of the top uh, plants in the list of top keystone plants, um, even throughout county by county throughout the country. And this is to me, a selective pressure of uh, landscapes historically being maintained by fire throughout the country that selected for more oak dominated ecosystems. So this is why I think in our mid Midwestern landscapes, uh, oak, something such as oak savannas can be uh, a very important model for climate resiliency and hosting the, the most biodiversity. If we look at keystone species from a native bee standpoint, we have keystone plants that are host plants for native bees because anywhere from 19 to 30 percent of our native bees are pollen specialists of certain types of native plants. And I did a quick calculation of just the plant genera that um, these specialist bees rely on here in Minnesota and approximately 93% of their host plants occur in these fire dependent systems. Um, just to touch on what uh, are these specialist bees and sort of the spectrum of specialization, we have very narrow specialists called monolectic specialists uh, and the females are specializing on just one plant species. So she will only collect pollen from a single plant species. Uh, there are narrow oligoelectric specialists that uh, specialize on one plant genus. So the example photo I have, uh, that Andrina integra is a type of mining bee and the females specialize on collecting just pollen from dogwoods in the genus Cornus. And then as you can see, uh, the specialization become, can become broader. Uh, and then bees that are characterized as polylectic would not be specialists because they're, they're seeking um, their pollen from a, a wide variety of plants. But anything less than a polylectic would be considered uh, a pollen specialist. And so here is just a look at those plant genera for Minnesota and the same sort of trends would um, occur for most states in the Eastern US. You can see that most of those plants are occurring um, are, and growing in grassland systems that would be maintained by fire. Uh, the, a smaller minority in woodlands, also fire maintained historically. And then we do have some species such as salix or our native willows that are supporting a high diversity of these bee pollen specialists in wetlands. But I want to sort of emphasize that these grassland systems are going to help these pollen specialists. And in many cases, uh, with climate change, they are at risk because they have this very narrow window of time to be active and overlap with the flowering phenology of the plants they depend on. And if plants are blooming um, different from what they did historically, then there could be the potential for a mismatch between these pollen specialists and the plants they depend on. So I wanna switch and look at um, fire and how fire maintained systems may benefit pollinators because we often think 
oh, fire is just killing all insects above ground uh, if we run a fire through a system. So this is a sort of sustainable agriculture study example. Uh, Shelley Wiggum and colleagues uh, did some research in Kansas ranches, so large uh, privately owned ranches. And all of the ranches in the study, the five um, did both patch burn grazing in addition to annual burns where they were burning um, the whole grassland at once versus the patch burn, they were burning no more than one third of the grassland or pasture annually. And her research uh, found that if co in comparing the patch burn with the wholesale burning annually patches, that the patch burn sites had a twofold increase in relative pollinator abundance, uh, a threefold increase in native bee species richness, and a twofold increase in butterfly species richness. Uh, this is just an illustration of some of the other results from her study, and I sort of updated it so we can better reflect um, the current year. This is not from her study specifically, but if we look at this, is the, the 2023 plot is the plot that is burned this year, and then the other plots were burned um, various years prior to 2023, so three years since fire patches. And she also radio tagged uh, queen bumblebees in the spring in these pastures and tracked their movements, including their nest searching behavior and where they ultimately established a nest. And she found that uh, most, the vast majority were selecting nesting sites in the two years since fire patch. And she hypothesized that the duff implant debris that had reaccumulated was perhaps attractive for these queen bumblebees. And then she also noted that the nests were in close proximity to the burned patch that had been burned that, that year. Also, the nests were uh, all located within 100 meters of a patch edge. So these, uh, you often hear about edge habitat being uh, supporting higher diversity, and these bumblebees were selecting all of their nest sites next to the edge of this two years since fire patch. She also found that 65% of the queen bumblebees and, and also the workers were out foraging uh, in the burn patch. So they were nesting in this area that had burned burn two years prior that had that duff layer, uh, but they're seeking out all of their, most of their floral resources in the burned area. And 32% uh, they were going to the patch that had been burned one year prior. So still uh, a higher abundance in floral diversity post burning. And this patchwork uh, is really creating um, this habitat that is uh, heterogeneic. Uh, it's uh, providing enough refuge for pollinator populations so that they can find appropriate nesting sites but they are seeking out plants in these uh, recently burned sites for, for their food resources. Another recent study by um, John Mola and colleagues, and they looked at um, burning and how that also influenced bumblebees. And this study, they found that um, they had equal abundance of bees that were both in burned and unburned sites. But as uh, the, we, the site transitioned from spring to summer, they found that the bumblebees uh, continued to just visit the burn site because of the increased floral abundance post burning. And also they found that the plants themselves were blooming for a longer period of time in the burned um, area versus the unburned area. And they also hypothesized that it was the density of flower patches uh, chosen by the bumblebee foragers in the burn sites that was influenced, influencing their, their foraging behavior. So if we think about burning thoughtfully from uh, not doing wholesale burning, which is usually discouraged even for uh, burn practitioners, but this patchwork of habitat uh, really with the use of fire can really help to support pollinators. I wanna switch back to this prairie to forest continuum to quickly define sort of some of these systems so we have a better sense. So prairie or meadow of course is a, 
a hundred percent grassland system. Uh, you may have one tree per acre in a prairie, that it, but it's still characterized as a prairie. And it is predominantly with herbaceous ground layer vegetation with grasses and flowering plants. A savanna, you start to have uh, oak tree recruitment because of the fire frequency. The canopy cover can be anywhere from five to 50%, but those trees, the woody plants that are starting to establish in that system are fire tolerant. And then with a woodland that is still fire maintained, uh, increased canopy cover 50 to 70%, but primarily all of the woody plants that are growing in a woodland are also fire tolerant because it's a fire maintained system. And finally, a forest. So closed canopy, shaded, more moist conditions than these other three systems. You have fire intolerant trees that are able to establish due to the, the fire interval. And um, you have a very different system at, from the standpoint of pollinators. So we know that, of course, <laughs> prairies are very low in tree diversity. Um, and if we look across this spectrum, the closed canopy forest would likely be high in tree diversity. My asterisk, however, is if we look at this from a forest succession post-colonial standpoint, um, this, this closed canopy forest can, cre can reach a climax state. And that maple basswood uh, forest that I have pictured there is primarily um, has sort of climaxed or reached a state of low diversity, very few tree species that are able to um, survive in that mature forest, primarily made up of maples. You can see all the maples in the understory ready to take over when a tree falls in that forest. So they don't ultimately become maintain high tree diversity at, at their final sort of mature state. So that is something to keep in mind. If we look at herbaceous diversity, of course, um, these grassland systems, savannas uh, can often have higher herbaceous diversity than uh, prairies themselves, but the spectrum is uh, really just going from high to low across this, uh, this continuum. Functionality, and this is where I think we really need to think of landscapes for pollinators, is how functional are they? How resilient are they? Uh, these grassland systems are much more functional if you're uh, using both fire and grazing in order to maintain them into these functional systems. Closed canopy forests are very low in functionality. And what I really want to talk about next is uh, some of the challenges of trying to restore these systems, because what has happened since uh, Euro-American settlement, there's been really large scale fire exclusion on the landscape for the last couple hundred years. And a lot of these systems along the continuum have transitioned to a forest. And this forest is not what the target that we really should be thinking about from um, a high uh, plant diversity, insect diversity, and so on. So a lot in a lot of cases, we are at this tipping point called mesofication. And Greg uh, Nowacki published this paper in 2008 that really coined this term mesofication. But again, this, this graphic from the study is looking at pre-1900, you'd had all fire tolerant trees growing in a more open system with a diverse herbaceous ground layer vegetation. And as we take fire out of the landscape, it's transitioning over time to more fire intolerant trees getting a foothold and finally um, turning into these closed canopy forests that are still a mix of fire tolerant and fire intolerant trees. And it's at this point where we have um, really a lot of encroachment by fire intolerant trees where here in the Midwest, invasive species really started to take hold. So things such as European buckthorn, garlic mustard, uh, they love these, this change in the system conditions and really thrive uh, in, in that change. This is another graphic from Greg Nowacki's paper, uh, looking at the, the left two 
uh, in a column and you can see that rolling ball graphic where it's, the ball is rolling back and forth in these troughs from oak savanna to oak forest, but it's stable with the uh, fire frequency. So the ball would roll back and forth depending on that fire interval. If you look at the bottom left graphic, when we take fire out of the system, the ball is just keeps rolling downhill and eventually it drops over that tipping point and drops what the authors called into the abyss. And this is where we are in, from an ecological restoration standpoint in a lot of our systems. We're trying to push that ball up over the tipping point like Sisyphus, but if we don't understand how to um, get the system from this unstable state back to a stable state, uh, we will just continue to be pushing the ball up the hill and having it roll back down. So this fire exclusion is, has led really to the proliferation of pyrophobic trees and a massive shift in tree composition in, in these wooded landscapes and creating more cool, moist conditions. So this picture of a fire-maintained oak savanna, we have a functional system with high pollinator diversity, the oaks uh, with their keystone species supporting an abundance of uh, lepidopteran larvae. This system with fire and grazing is going to allow for opportunities for oak regeneration, which is a problem in um, systems that have become invaded by fire intolerant trees. And this system to me seems very climate resilient given our modeling for, for here in the Midwest. This is the abyss. So this is the mesovocation of oak ecosystems. And we see this air everywhere where uh, oak ecosystems are dominant. So the green plant is European buckthorn, uh, the, the most prevalent uh, plant that invades understories. But again, it has invaded this understory due to long-term fires um, suppression and the change in the, in the composition of this wooded landscape. So this is a dysfunctional system that is going to have low pollinator diversity. And it's this systemic change that's really putting out that welcome mat. Here is another picture just as an illustrated example. So my orange markings are on oak trees within this picture. These oak trees even um, aren't, they don't look that big since they are slow growing and long lived. Um, those trees could be anywhere from 80 to 100 years old. And then surrounding the oak trees, my blue markers are on fire intolerant trees. So even looking at this from what is happening over the last 100 or 50 years in this landscape, there has been encroachment of fire intolerant trees. Uh, the last thing is the this the site has been the manager has been cutting buckthorn. So you see that green uh, understory layer of woody buckthorn that has been cut multiple times. So sort of the Sisyphus approach of we just manage the invasive species in the system and we're somehow going to solve the problem. But if we don't um, take out these, uh, these trees that are encroaching the system and reintroduce fire, then we're spending all of this money on natural area restoration without really getting any results. So this, these conditions are, again, are creating this welcome mat for invasive species. So the, the mesofication of these oak ecosystem is really problematic to me. And it creates a lot of challenges from um, a financial and cost standpoint and also how do we communicate that more open habitats that are fire maintained are going to be more resilient and support more pollinator species. So these shaded conditions, again, are creating these mesophytic shade tolerant species to move in, which are really creating this positive or self-reinforcing feedback loop. And it leads to the decline of these oak ecosystems. So with future climate warming, should we be maintaining a lot of these systems as closed canopy forests? Well, it's not going to help uh, the insect and pollinator crisis so much. And if we can't start preserving, restoring, and reconstructing grasslands and reintroducing fire, then we uh, are really not ready for um, having climate resilient natural areas within 
within our state and, and also within the region. So um, this is just a quick example of a project that I've been working on with a, a nonprofit that I serve on the board um, here in the metro area and in the Twin Cities. So this is a 13 acre oak savanna restoration project. You can see this is one of the oldest oak trees on the property. It's a white oak that has been aged to be over 240 years old. And it is completely surrounded by mature uh, invasive buckthorn. Uh, it, what you can't see in this picture is there's also been a heavy encroachment by fire intolerant um, trees as well. The historical original vegetation by the surveyors in this area, this, this whole region um, where this restoration occurred was oak savanna. And so we think, okay, this is this is a reasonable target, even though it seems like we're rolling back the clock in time. We are also thinking about how this system will be more resilient uh, going forward. So one of the techniques used now is uh, almost forestry harvesting type equipment. This is a, a feller buncher. And this machine has a large carbide blade that can miraculously cut and grapple uh, bundles of both invasive plants in addition to cut down trees. So with surgical preci precision on frozen ground, um, contractors can work through a site quite quickly and clear uh, a relatively large number of acres in a short period of time. So this was applied uh, over a year ago at this site and this was a, a drone photo taken after the uh, buckthorn harvesting and clearing of some of the fire intolerant trees. That tree in the foreground middle is that big old oak. And you can see it's now has some breathing room. It no longer has competition from surrounding invasive plants and fire intolerant trees. This system will now allow for oak regeneration going forward. And uh, next steps, of course, are reintroducing fire into the landscape and then taking advantage of that temporarily burned ground in order to start seeding and establishing that ground layer grassland vegetation. Long term, uh, it would be wonderful to reintroduce grazers. And I'm not going to talk about that today, but there are two excellent talks on grazing scheduled for Thursday at the conference. So be sure to tune in more about uh, to learn more about grazing. So hopefully I um, am under time here, but I just want to say uh, I've been really giving a lot of thought to ecological land stewardship. Uh, and the role that Native Americans had historically uh, in using fire and helping to communicate that profound influence of, of their, their land stewardship. Uh, and also I think as ecological land stewards, we need to prioritize foraging partnerships and Scott talked about this. So we can better understand both historical and current um, land stewardship knowledge and practices. And so finding these opportunities really to initiate inclusion understanding and also reconciliation so that we uh, can better move forward together in developing more climate resilient landscapes. I'll leave you with this quote um, just up. I'm not going to read it and I'll hopefully have time for questions, but if not, I'll be tuning into the conference and you're free to direct message me on the chat if you would like to know more.